Hello, I'm Dennis. I work in Red Hat. I can't put the thing in my pocket for some reason. Uh, and I develop Overt. The Overt, I hope it works. Yes, it works. And Overt works too. So, Overt is an enterprise grade virtualization management system. Hundreds of hosts, thousands of VMs, external API, lot of storage interconnections, integrates with all the stuff you can imagine. Really. The guy before me just told, okay, we integrate with Kubernetes. It's called Kubeert. And before I continue, I would like to tell a little bit more on how Overt is made. It's not that important to really take it details like, oh, we have some stuff there, but we need just one single thing, and I would like to mention it. So we can think about Overt as a system made of three layers. The lower one, the best one, is a storage subsystem. Here we store all your VM data. Your snapshots or VM templates or ISO images, everything stored here. And the most interesting part is storage subsystem is not a part of Overt usually. So we use external storages like storage area networks or NFS servers or something like that. Uh, the only requirement by us is that we need it to be shared between all the hosts. And hosts, they make a second layer, the host where you run your VMs. We call them VDSM host for a reason, because VDSM is the name of our host agent. So every host have a VDSM, and VDSM knows how to run your VM, how to create a network, how to attach a storage, how to do stuff. The only thing it doesn't know what, how to do is what to do. He have no brain. It's like a really stupid and uh, straightforward application that only executes commands by the second layer, the engine. Huge and big and very smart application written in Java and running. Guess what? It runs inside of VM. Yeah, we have a VM controlling all other VMs and we have a special tool set for it. So it's fully redundant and highly available, and engine controls everything. Engine knows, oh, this host have enough resources. This host have enough RAM. This host is overloaded. Oh, this guy wants to access that snatch shop and have no rights. It's all on the engine side. I'm not going to talk about over too much today. I mostly will be talking about storage pool and storage domain and other storage boring things. Uh, but why I'm going to talk about that? Why we need virtualization at all? There are a lot of reasons for virtualization, but one of the reasons, and I know the guys who pay for all of that are loving it, that one of the reasons is the resources. Now, in 21st century, I t checked it this morning, the smallest hard drive for a server you can buy, I mean, spin hard drive, is about 300 gigabytes big. Now imagine you would like to install, say, DNS server. So you have operating system, five gigabytes probably. You have a DNS server with your data, some other stuff, so probably you're using just 10 gigabytes. And uh, you have 290 gigabytes of a drive inside of your server, you paid for it and you are not using it. And your finance department is quite unhappy. Like, why? Why we are not using 90% of our resources? And then say, oh, okay, we can use virtualization. We can have 10 virtual small servers making small tasks and sharing the 300 gigabytes drive. So now you use almost 100%. But is it really 100%? Suddenly you realize it's no. No, 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 no. You have 10 VMs and each VM uses 30 gigabyte drive. But actually it writes like say five to 10 to 15, some of them use in all, some of them use just five gigabytes, some of them don't use at all because you forgot to deploy them. And actually you are not using your resources again. So then you say, okay, maybe, maybe I could squeeze it more. Maybe I could just give VMs a storage space that they really need. And now you can put 25 VMs 
or 30, okay, 35 VMs or 40 VMs. Doesn't matter. And then I say, okay, but some of them, they really need the, their 30 gigabytes, but only two hours a day. And some other VM need them on the other hours a day. And you say, okay, I can put even more VM and um, use some kind of time multiplexing so they don't will be using the same data all the day. So now you are overbooking. And everyone who's met that in airline should start hating it, but it's, as I told you, finance department loves it. Do we have it in Overt? Of course. If we will not have it in Overt, I will not be there. And how we implement it in Overt? The first and really simple thing, I believe everyone knows about it, but I have to start with it. It's the same provisioning. That's what I told you. The idea is simple. The VM believes you have a really big drive, say 50 gigabytes, but it only uses five gigabytes of it. And you only allocate five gigabytes of your storage domain. So you have 50 gigabyte VM, but it only uses five gigabytes and you can use 20 VMs of that size. How it works? You would say, oh, come on, that guy is telling us obvious things. Yeah, I'm starting with obvious things. It would be more interesting later. So, Ovirt works with two types of storage domains. First one is a file storage domain, so it can be NFS or any POSIX FS, say Gluster FS. And here we use sparse files. I don't believe anyone there doesn't know what a sparse file or what I have to say. The sparse file is just a file with holes. If you have a big file and you haven't written anything here inside of that file yet, it will not use any space on the drive. As you may see, you have holes and those holes are not on the drive. But logically, you have a big file and physically it's still small. Second option, um, block device. And block device is a little bit more complicated. Overt started using block devices earlier than a thin LVM arise. So we had to invent our own approach. And with block devices, what we do, when you create a big VM, say 50 gigabytes, we only allocate logical volume of one gigabyte and start continuously looking into it and checking, oh, how much data it's used? One byte, don't worry, 10 bytes. Oh, 800 megabytes. So when you hit some threshold, Overt immediately extends your volume to the next gigabyte and start watching it again. And when you hit the threshold, guess what happens? Another one extension. And so on, and so on, and until you're full. The problem here with both uh, same provision on files and same provision here on the LVM is that we can't reclaim that space back. So if your VM created five, 100 gigabyte file for a second and then deleted it and actually allocated and deleted that, your stuff and your storage domain will be full. You will have that five gigabyte allocation there forever. We can't reclaim it back, sorry, especially with that, that approach. And we don't like it. The problem is that Usually, Overt doesn't control the storage. The storage, as I told you earlier, is external to us. So we have some Sun, we have some NFS server. We don't control the whole storage stack. Or do we? Mm. Ah, it's not working anymore. That interesting thing. Yeah, but manually it still works. Sometimes, we control our storage stack completely from drives to VM. Because we have a hyper-converged environment of over. And how do we do that? We need a shared storage. We need a shared storage. The only requirement by over storage domain is that each host in an over cluster have access to the same storage and have a same view of that storage. Can we do that? Of course, we can take Gluster. Gluster, amazing. Software-defined storage, a file system running in user space. 
It's like NFS, but much, 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 much better and have a lot of features and faster and don't have NFS uh, sickness, <laughs> I would say. Uh, what cluster does? Actually, you may have a lot of servers. That's the typical commodity hardware. You don't need um, expensive hardware anymore. Just buy cheap servers and so on. And on each server, you can install a cluster software and export some directories. And those exports, we call them bricks, can be combined to volumes. And volume act at a, it's like a mountable file system. So you can mount a volume and each client of that volume will have a same view for the file system. It will be shared, same namespace. All files will be available. Doesn't matter how, how much do you have clients. You may have a lot of servers. You may have a lot of volumes. You may construct any system you like. And the best part here, that volume is not just a collection of bricks. It can be just a collection of bricks, like, you know, combining them together. But no, 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 no. You, you may have more of them. First of all, you may have a replicated volume. So same data is copied several times and kept on several bricks. And when some of the bricks or servers disappears, data is still here and you still have access for it. You may have distributed replicated. If I remember correctly, we have like nine or 10 flowers of volume. Am I right? We have a glass of developer here. That's why I'm asking. Nine or 10 flowers of volumes. And yeah, redundant, highly available, scalable. It scales to petabytes. It scales to hundreds of servers. It sounds like a great choice for Ovir. And yeah, we use it. So we use Gluster as a storage subsystem for Overt. And the Gluster volumes are consumed by Overt as a storage domains. So we, now we can use same nodes, I mean literally same hardware for running a storage, for running your VMs, for hosting your engine VM. Yeah, it's quite special one VM because it controls everything. And you don't need external subsystem for storage, you don't need NFS, you don't need fiber channel, you don't need anything. Now you have it on just a cheap commodity hardware and it's scalable and it's highly available thanks to Gluster and redundant. And what is more important for us, we have a control of a storage stack from drive to VM. Can we use it? Oh yeah. With Gluster, we use LVM. And we use LVM theme pools. So when you deploy a hyper-converged environment of over, you deploy LVM on top of your hard drive, and then you cre create a logical volume for engine. We don't want engine to die suddenly. That's why we have a pre-allocated engine volume. And then you deploy to theme pool, a theme pool and two volume for your data, sharing that theme pool. What it gives us? You have 100 theme pool. On top of it, you might have two of size of 100, so in total 200 storage domains, running some VMs, and it's compressed. And the best part here, when you delete something on VM, VM sends a twin command to block layer. And KVM is smart enough, we use KVM and KVMU, to pass the twin command to Gluster. And Gluster, yeah, I will repeat it again, it's smart enough to pass it to LVM. And guess what do LVM theme pool? It will say, hooray, this block is not in use anymore, I can return it back to theme pool. So it works like a theme provision, but better. Well, I mean theme provision with sparse files, but better. Now your space is reclaimed back. So in my case, you have two VMs of 50 gigabytes each, using just five gigabytes, on top of 200 gigabytes storage domains, on top of just 100 gigabyte, on top of just 100 gigabytes drive. And you still use 10 gigabytes of it. But you pretend to have more. And that's not all. I'm coming to the best part of my presentation, the, the, the core part. Probably you know that VMs are usually almost same. 
uh, I don't believe anyone will be installing hundreds of VMs of really different kind. Like, uh, just curious, did anyone ever installed all the version of Windows on the same uh, virtualization cluster? <coughs> please say no, please say no. <laughs> okay, nobody, yes. So usually you have almost homogeneous VMs. So usually you stick to have same version or not, not really same, but close enough version of your operating system. You use almost same software. And when, you, when I say that same, same, and same, it comes to deduplication. So you have a lot of redundant data, repeating data all the time. Especially uh, yesterday, someone, no, I don't, I don't see you there today. Yesterday, someone come, came to our booth and asked, can we use a OVIRT for virtual, desktop, virtual desktops uh, and uh, what they actually have? Uh, he told me he works in university and he would like to start two or three hundred VM for two hours. And he was really concerned about space. Because yeah, I have a template, what he told me, I have a template for 50 gigabytes, and then I have 100 of VMs, and 100 of 50 gigabytes will be five terabytes, I don't have that much space, can we save it somehow? I told him to come, to come there, but he's in, I don't see him, okay. So, we can deduplicate all the data. And what we are doing, we are actually deduplicating. We are using a virtual data optimizer, a tool by, let me turn it on. We are using virtual data optimizer, a tool by Red Hat and Permabit company that does three interesting things. It works as a device mapper driver. So yeah, just integrates to LVM and all that sub subsystems. And uh, it can make, uh, block device from block device. Bigger block device from smaller block device. How it does it? It starts analyzing blocks written to the storage. So when block hits the storage, it reads it and checks. Does that block contains just a sequence of same byte, like block full of zeros? <laughs> oh yeah, it does. Drop it, we don't need it at all. Uh, have I seen any of the blocks earlier? It keeps indexing RAM, it keeps uh, some information. Have I seen it? Yes, drop it. We can reuse the previous one. And finally, when it have less blocks, it compresses them and stores them back to device, saving your space. And what happens next? Oh no. Oh no, how do, how do I, oh, it really sucks. Okay, you will see a lot of things. Give me a second, oh no, 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 no. So, how do we use it? We put the duplication layer between the storage drive and LVM. So, pretending you have 100 gigabyte storage drive, real one, you can have a logical volume group of one terabyte, one to 10. And on top of it, you, have, you still have logical volume for engine, and then you have a thin pool, and on top of the thin pool, you have the volumes you already seen, but now it looks more and more and more pyramidic. <laughs> what it gives us? You have just 10 gigabyte drive. And you pretend that your 10 gigabyte drive is 100 gigabyte storage domain. And don't, uh, sorry, not, not storage domain, your 100 gigabyte thin pool. And on top of it, you make 200 gigabyte of storage domain and say allocate five VM, 50 gigabytes each, write in five gigabytes. So now what you have, you have five VMs believing they have 250 gigabytes 
and uh, you believe that they allocated 25 gigabytes, but actually you are still using about four gigabytes on a drive. 220 gigabytes up there, four gigabytes down there. Isn't that impressive? Is it working, really working? Yep. I actually, 10 gigabytes uh, and 205, 250 gigabytes is not just example. Uh, I made some calculations and uh, I installed a demo system at my home and make that video and actually used those numbers. So, when you install just the first VM, and I use CentOS version 7.3, 7.4, and 7.5 in rotation. First VM uses about one and four gigabyte of physical drive and four, well, about five gigabyte of uh, logical space. The second VM adds just less than gigabyte and still you have about seven gigabyte of lo logical space. Why it's not working? And, all, and third VM, fourth VM, and fifth VM, and I repeat, it's a little bit different versions of CentOS. They add about 200 megabytes, not gigabytes, but 200 megabytes to the physical storage. So it almost doesn't grow. I installed five VMs on just four gigabytes, and they were working. And all of them believe that, okay, we have 250 gigabytes but they didn't. I'm carefully switching to next slide to not to get out of presentation. Ah, yeah, it works. So, the best part is over. Now we came to the ground and real earth. The sim provisioning and especially compression and dead application isn't free and the price is high. The first problem, using that dead application and compression is very, very risky. It, it have the same risk as a plane on Forex market with a leverage, because we have leverage there. You have 250 gigabytes on this side and just 10 gigabytes on this side. And if you suddenly start writing data on this side, you may overflow your small, tiny, petty storage drive. And what will happen after that? All your VMs on the storage domains on top of your small video device will be affected. They will not be able to write anything. And it may happen just suddenly. Everything went fine, you were writing data. Your VMs are fine, you have 10 VMs, oops, you don't have anything, you have your cluster down, you're running out of space. That's really, really, really bad. Please, don't do that. And we are going to help you with that. You have to monitor physical space. You have to monitor physical space on your device carefully and all the time. We actually call it a guaranteed space, and there's a reason. We guarantee that you will be able to write that amount of data. Maybe more, but not less. And if you're trying to write something, just take a look on a guaranteed space and think about that. Like, I have 10 gigabytes. It may be not compressible data, and I only have two gigabytes of guaranteed space. It can be a problem. How do we do that? As I told you, VDO is a, just a device mapper driver. So you can stack all the device mappers and you may have thin pool on top of video as we do, or you may revert it, so you may have thin pool and video on top of it, or you can make a Oreo, or thin pool, video, thin pool, or you may continue it until you are bored. So we scan all the devices, we scan all the devices, and we try to choose the smallest one thin pool device. I don't mean the smallest one in size. The smallest one device in terms of how much space it has and report it to a brick. You still remember that cluster bricks and stuff. 
And the brick is a physical thing. The brick is a mount point of some device. So we report it to a brick and store it in a brick. And then we calculate same value for volume. And if the volume have a connection to a glass, uh, to a storage domain, you have to check a special checkbox for that. It also will be reported for a storage domain. And you can take a look on it. So if you have a, a brick, on the brick properties, you see how much space it have and the duplication compression savings. There is no savings there because it's a storage domain and brick from a different installation. It's actually empty. That's why it's zero. Same works for a main view of a storage domain. So when you open, no, it's not. Where is it? When you open storage domain dashboard, it's so important, so we put it even on dashboard. You will see how much space you have and how much space is available. And the guaranteed free space is blurry this, there. I have no idea why. It doesn't suppose, supposed to be blurry. And you can also configure a threshold. So if your guaranteed free space will be used, to, will be less than, say, in my case, 10% of the physically available space of your simple device, of your SIM device, it can be simple or video on any of them, you will start getting an events and messages. And as it's a, just an overt message, uh, event and system, you can get a mail, a SNMP, whatever. But that's not all. That's not the thing you would just pay in. That was the most important thing, because it can break everything. If you run out of space, it will just break. And you can run out of space really, really fast. Because that multiplicator works in both directions. The other problem is that I told you, the duplication, the duplication and compression isn't free. You spend your CPU cycles for it. Of course, you have to spend your CPU for checking the index, checking the blocks, compressing them. Uh, in worst case, it may re reduce your IOPS up to 30%. In best case, it may increase your IOPS. Yeah, I've heard that from drive space times, like, oh, you know, drives are so slow and CPUs are so fast. So if you can compress the data, it may, be, it may require less physical I.O. operations. Now, in 21st century, drives are still living in 20th century and CPUs are fast enough right now. So it may happen. I've seen that on a really, really slow drives. Compression and the duplication increases performance of your I.O. subsystem. The another one thing you pay, and it's really important, because it's really important for, uh, in a virtualization environment. You have to pay a lot of RAM. You use about one gigabyte of RAM for each terabyte of a logical space. Uh, and uh, it we recommend it to be a smallest part, so one to 10 and just one terabyte. You spend a lot of RAM, sorry. We have to keep index somewhere. And we also keep a copy of the index on a storage domain, um, not on a storage domain, on a cluster volume, on a physical volume. So yeah, we are stealing your physical volume. Sorry, guys. Lots of space is used for the duplication. So on small drives, it's not that, that good as it can be. But the good news there, the good news, all the slides, this one, Oh, no, 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 why it's not visible? Okay, those numbers, they include that overhead. So that one gigabyte, 37 megabytes of a storage domain for VM, <laughs> it includes overhead of keeping index there. For second VM, it's same. For third VM, it's same. So it still makes sense. And it's not that bad. You are not spending more gigabytes for keeping index. No, 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 no. You can get more data of it. Soon you're going to lunch. What it's all about? Why we spend those 30 minutes with me? Now you know that uh, with overt and over hyperconverged, you may believe or you may tell your VMs that you have up to 25 times more space than you actually have. And you can even try to use all of that. 
Unfortunately, it works only with hyperconverged because we have to control the whole storage stack. Sorry, if we use some external storage, we can't do that. And uh, everything comes with price. And the first price is a multiplicator that works in both directions. So yeah, you are multiplicating your gigabyte to 25 gigabytes of available data. And then you multiplicate your 25 gigabytes back. No magic here. If you try to write too, more, too much data, you will be screwed, sorry. And yes, finally, finally. You have to spend your RAM. You have to spend your disk space. You have to spend your CPU cycles for achieving that wonderful 25 times improvement of space. Sorry, it's not free. And thank you. Do you have any questions? Yeah. You said that the uh, hyperconvergence is necessary, but from your presentation, it looks like it's a uh, more related cluster. An external cluster will benefit of the same integration with the UI, or is uh, really only hyperconvergent the solution that uh, would benefit? OK, the question was, uh, can we use external cluster and benefit from it, right? The answer is yes and no. Yes, you can install cluster and you can install cluster and video externally, configure it on your own and use all the features of cluster. And no, sorry, we can't monitor it. You have to implement it on your own. We only can monitor the cluster volumes we, we are managing. Uh, the, Partial solution could be, uh, you know, you don't really need a hyperconverged system in case you would like to use cluster. So you may have a cluster nodes in that cluster, I mean an overt cluster, managed by overt, but not running VMs. So it will be like partially external. So just to uh, continue, if I could not correctly, if the cluster storage is managed by overt, but it's not used for a uh, for computation, yeah, if it's managed by Overt, we will be able to get all the data from it, and we will be able to link the data from cluster to storage domains and give you, give you monitoring information. But in, even if it's not, you can still use it. The, you only have to monitor it on your own and configure it on your own, not via UI. You're welcome. So I believe everyone is hungry. Well, if no more questions, thank you, and thank you for attending.